Welcome. Tonight, Richard Rizak will give a lecture entitled On Sculpture, Influence, Context, Process, a brief overview of his sculptural work since 1985. He will share the methodology that leads to his completed work, including images of preparatory drawings and source materials. Building on the traditions of minimalism and post-minimalism, Richard Rizak's balanced and elegant sculptures are brought to life through various materials, like painted and unpainted wood, cast iron, bronze, aluminum, and silk. Using personal nuances and cultural illusions, Rizak's work breathes vitality into abstraction by layering multiple meanings and references with finite forms. Richard Rizak is an adjunct professor of painting and drawing at the School of the Art Institute. In 2017, his work will be the subject of a 30-year retrospective at Parasol Unit Foundation for Contemporary Art, London. Recent works will also be featured in an upcoming two-person show with artist Diana Frid at the, De at the DePaul Art Museum. His work has been included in group shows at the Art Institute of Chicago, the Smart Museum of Art, Museum of Contemporary Art, White Columns, and the Cochrane Gallery of Art. He has received multiple awards, including a Joan Mitchell Foundation grant, a John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, and a Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Award. Please welcome Richard Rizak. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for the generous introduction, Patty. Um, so I think you understand my approach tonight. Um, I moved to Chicago in 1985. That seemed like a, an appropriate time to begin with um, the bracket of my work from, from then until now. And so the first um, four um, juxtapositions um, sort of um, explain that, I guess, an early work and a late work. And um, so just to, um, I guess just to, to list a bit the, um, the change and yet the, the constant um, um, factors that have remained in my work um, over these some 25, 30 years. Um, there's complexity in the form now. Um, there's more extensive use um, of applied color less volumetric form and now more linear or open structures with surfaces that are either transparent or reflective. All of these developments towards complexity, of course, subdivides the sculpture as one looks at it, not in like the analytical way as we look at a painting's composition. But since it is a three-dimensional object, this open structure makes one more fully aware of the space around it, even the architectural setting that it shares. Um, the elements in my sculpture over these years that are unchanged, I think, are several. The basic use of abstraction as my visual language. Most of my work has been untitled, and only those with a conscious reference are titled. An organizing principle present through geometric form, symmetry, or repetition. Um, a pronounced contrasting set of forms or materials, um, relatively small in size, often in reference to human scale and viewpoint. The reliance on preliminary drawing for every sculpture that I've made. Um, next, I'd, let me mention a bit about um, the foundation of my art education. I went to an art school as an undergraduate in Portland, Oregon a museum school, and its relationship to the museum next door was my first exposure to an art museum. The opportunity for a direct, free, and continuous experience of seeing art, mainly from the permanent collection, was an integrated extension of the classroom. This private and experiential relationship to works of art was the perfect reinforcement to the collective nature of my in-class studio work. Um, for me, most important because of 
It was so unexpected. Um, sorry. Um, was the contact with Asian and North Native American collections. These are mostly objects, all human scale, handmade, tactile, modest, most often simple and symmetrical, based in geometry, functional, and many of these embedded with symbolism, meaning, or language unfamiliar to me. Nevertheless, potent and in some sense abstract to my eyes. As important to me as anything else was the privilege of direct access to these works, and I would add, in quiet and secluded circumstances. This part of my education, beginning in 1970, was a constant for me, so especially when I travel, I look for the same direct access in art and architecture. Concurrent, uh, and for five years after I graduated, I gained tremendously from the Portland Center for the Visual Arts, an artist-formed exhibition and performance space that existed from 1973 until the mid-1980s, presenting American contemporary art in monographic shows, new work or in a survey format, by many now historic minimal and pop artists, architectural installations by the likes of Terrell, Irwin, Nauman, and the young Chris Burden, painting shows by Alice Neal, Leon Golub, Agnes Martin, Elizabeth Murray, and many others. Um, for eight years, I was a volunteer, assisting in the installation of many of these, and I well remember a show of about 35 graphite drawings by Jim Nutt um, from the time that he and Gladys were living in California. Um, Apropos of these educational experiences for me, to summarize, I would quote this line from a lecture given um, by a painter and designer, John Lafarge, at the Metropolitan Museum in 1893, titled, Considerations on Painting. And I quote, good language is learned by living among people who can themselves speak well. So this slide, uh, these details, on the left you see um, a sort of borrowed Roman column, marble column that's gilded, um, taken into a major Roman church during the Baroque period, and a Quaker, a shaker um, handrail. Um, since art school, I've relied on a process in making sculpture that is quite simple, and direct, represented here by these two details. I depend on time-honored processes, and the drawing I do in advance generally offers access in its construction. The iron rail was either heated and bent around a form, or cast in parts and riveted together, not unlike the making of a drawing. And the fluting within this Roman column was done by rough carving in the marble, then in the same way as this, um, by use of a profile scraper or measure, um, to rather measure or gauge consistency from one end to the other. Um, so I know this slide looks very confusing. The sculpture finished is on the right, the most recent sculpture I've done. On the left, you see on a table surface somewhat um, um, in levitation because it's on this green form on the top of the sculpture, um, there are two um, scrapers. <laughs> Here and there that um, were taken from the drawing that I did um, as a preliminary. Now these other, sh um, this is also a, um, a, a singular scraper. Probably something like that would have been used actually in the, um, to make these flutes. But um, these two are commercial scrapers. Those two are specific to this sculpture. So you can see that it, it, it hugs the profile here. And um, I've used those really 
for 25 years or so in one way or another with various materials, whether it's often wood, plaster, wax, and giving me a, a kind of continuous, constant um, uh, form. And, um, the, you know, the tool is primarily a ruler or a gauge um, indicating um, regularity, but also in the final analysis, woodworkers typically use something like that even um, before the invention of sandpaper as a way to um, um, justify or, or clean a surface in a regular way. So often I don't use sandpaper. I use these scrapers as the final um, series of passes to smooth it. Um, this is an example of a drawing with a sculpture in the, on the lower right of this, um, this drawing, you can see some two blue shapes here, which is the elevation. Um, if this is a plan, like a footprint of the sculpture, those are the yellow um, wooden forms. And so there would have been a shape or a shape, um, there would have been a, um, a profile that, um, that gave me this um, form of molding um, in continuous pieces put together and then obviously painted. And this is a sculpture that was done consistently in that way. The, the three wooden parts, um, the exception being the, the, aluminum, um, the aluminum channel that's been modified. But the other three parts were all, um, first of all, roughly carved and then with rasps and then the shaper, um, the, um, um, the scraper, um, it gave me the, the consistent um, curves that you see. This is um, a corner of my studio where I've made really every sculpture for the last 25 years. I correct that, um, last 20, 18, 20 years. Now, um, Brancusi, I think of all the, the um, sculpt, all the artists of the 20th century is probably um, at the top is influence for me um, and had, has been really since, um, since as an undergraduate in school. Um, what you see on the left is an interesting picture of a sculpture that Catherine Dreyer, the great um, art patron, painter, um, founder of Society in Nomine, arguably the first um, uh, manifestation of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Um, she amassed a great collection of, of um, advanced art. This is a, a work of Brancusi's that, as you know, is in the museum collection. Um, on her death in about 1950, Marcel Duchamp, who helped her accumulate her collection, um, was her executor and distributed those works. And um, this is one of those that he sent to the Art Institute. Now another form, um, another aspect, I guess, of, of especially modernism that um, has been very important to me and my thinking, and, and, and frankly, I think it's very pervasive throughout um, contemporary art, certainly modernism, um, post-First World War, is the notion of fragments. Um, I guess you can go back, think of archeological digs when um, in the 18th century or so, um, one would find broken pieces of a figure and the dynamic, the, um, the kind of suggestiveness that, that that gave an artist like Rodin, certainly Brancusi. Um, I think Cubism um, also contributed to this notion of um, a part that speaks to the whole. Photography, especially street photography in the 50s and so on, where the abrupt um, cropping um, has a dynamic. And also I think Duchamp himself, when um, in his ready-mades and then in contemporary appropriation, taking something familiar out of context, that to me is a form of um, fragmentation that, um, that lends, um, I think, um, 
you know, great symbolism actually, and also um, it speaks for the whole, but also one can see it in isolation for its own, um, in its own terms. This is an example, I suppose, of a work of mine that um, um, speaks to fragmentation or incompletion. So it's that tension between um, the question, you know, um, a motif that, um, that leads to continuity, repetition, and uh, a kind of pattern, but at the same time is stillborn and has um, its own identity. Um, a more recent interest of mine is um, Baroque architecture, and here you see um, two works. The, the one on the, the left, the only building that Piranesi built, he's known obviously as a um, great printmaker of that period, um, focused on architecture. Um, and on the right, um, in Naples, a um, entryway by a, a Neapolitan um, architect named San Felice. Not so well known, but greatly influenced by this architect, uh, Francesco Bormini. And it's really my interest in um, Italian Baroque that, that took me to Rome for a year, where I spent a year at the American Academy uh, with the intention of looking most of all and very intently at his um, 10 or so buildings in Rome. Oh, by the way, the, um, on the right there you see an elevation drawing. So the drawings I do um, are indebted completely to the, um, the notion or the discipline of traditional architectural drawings of plan, elevation as you see here, and perhaps detail. So next I'll show you a few works where the drawing is juxtaposed um, to the sculpture. And I think in many ways it's self-evident. Um, the work on the left is, um, it's about the size of a single bed. And I thought of it in those terms in, in a kind of um, figurative way. At the bottom register of this drawing, you see variations or possibilities for what ended up being a more select number of these cast bronze, nickel-plated um, droplets that emerge from the bottom of the sculpture. And this, uh, the, the sculpture looks um, much more um, confusing, I suppose, than the drawing. But if you were standing immediately under the sculpture, you would see this alignment and overlap and a kind of um, sensibility. So the next group I will show you are a few um, wall pieces that are completely reliant on vertical, horizontal um, orientation. And in art school as an undergraduate, I studied painting and sculpture um, quite fully. And I think um, still I, I look to painting as um, a kind of reinforcement for many of my decisions. And the scale of my work is not unlike easel painting. The frontality and the way in which um, the surfaces and the detail, I think, invite or in, in fact force one to look at them close enough as you would the surface of a painting to understand um, the, um, oh, the resonance, the, um, the particular relationship of, um, I suppose, the brushstroke, but in my case, um, the form with the color, maybe reflectivity. And I think um, with this, sort of beginning premise of my interest early on minimalism and simplicity and um, graduating towards something more complex. These works that, um, that have a structure that is in repetition or in alignment um, have a, a kind of 
position, I suppose, between the stability that it seems to me every minimalist work has. Um, they are um, immovable. And the, um, the dynamic and the movement one puts to Baroque art. And yet, it seems to me that the Baroque architecture, for sure, maybe not the painting, but and, or the sculpture, but the architecture relies completely on geometry to hold it together. There's a lot of repetition um, in Baroque architecture, and the sense of stability when you're looking at or within those buildings, I think, is not any different, really, than minimalism. Um, obviously, they're vastly different, but, but in terms of their under, under um, layment, their, um, their foundation, it, it's all within geometry. So next I'll show you a group of works where there is actually a very um, immediate direct connection between the source, where I've taken the photograph um, or borrowed the photograph, and um, the outcome as a sculpture. Now, in graduate school in Baltimore, um, for the two years I was a teaching assistant in Japanese art history. So a few years after, I was fortunate to travel to Japan on extended trips on two occasions. And um, this is one example um, confronting this seated, um, somewhat guardian figure outside of a great temple. Um, the situation of a weathered, wooden, old, sculpture that um, was constantly replenished by, the, um, by those going into the uh, temple with a reddish or pinkish um, fabric. So the contrast between old and new, um, the, the kind of solid and the temporal um, was very striking to me. And this, I was intrigued by the um, the corners of this um, treasure house where, like our log cabin, um, these timbers, though, are fashioned as triangles. So if you go inside this building, the walls are flat. Um, but it's at the corners where there's this um, give and take, zigzag exchange that replayed itself for me um, on the corners of this cast concrete sculpture. And then this is a drawing, um, and then the resulting sculpture of a work that comes from this garden in Kyoto. Um, it's, it's thought to be a mythological Chinese lake, in the shape of a mythological Chinese lake. So the, um, the bands are representative of um, raked, um, well, it's raked sand, but it's, it's meant to, um, like so many gardens, um, represent waves. So when I saw this, um, I was intrigued. I mean, it's, it's quite um, abstract. And so the thumb, what you think of as the thumb is here and also up here. This component is a sand mound, um, the site of a previous um, small building that was used as a platform to look at the full moon. And um, the building burned down. This sand mound was um, placed instead, and apparently it's quite magical. If there is a full moon, the illumination on the top is extraordinary, and it, in a sense, brings the moon onto the garden. Um, but for my purpose, the, um, this strange shape of, the, um, of this mound, um, it, I, I I walked around um, and, and did a sketch, tried to, tried to uh, make sense of what that form would have been. Um, back in Chicago, probably a year later, I um, made this drawing and then ultimately the sculpture. Um, this is um, it's a very common um, treatment of the Buddha, and you may know the um, as a young wealthy prince, he wore very heavy gold earrings. It distended his lobe. Um, so it's a, it's a common image that portrays that transformation from material to spiritual life. And um, 
This was really one of the wor first works I made that was quite literal and, and, and really meant as a kind of quotation. I, I thought not to treat both ears as the same. It, it, was, it seemed clear to me there needed to be two ears to state the fact that they represented ears, but I saw no reason to make them identical. And then this was a painting I saw while I was in Rome at a small museum. Um, St. Lucy is a, um, a fairly common um, subject in southern Italy. She was martyred by having her eyes taken out. She's the patron saint of the blind. And this was a most strange painting. It was much darker, actually, than this image, without much color. But um, you could hardly see the eyes in the painting. And it made it all the more ghostly. So um, this is my response. In most of the paintings, uh, the figure is holding her eyeballs on a platter, silver platter usually with reflection. So it was um, necessary for me to frame it in this way. And then um, two works derived from this Dutch tile that um, Julia and I saw in, at the Rijksmuseum a few years ago. Um, it's about the size of the sculpture, and what intrigued me was the, um, the lean or the, the askew nature of the oval, um, but at the same time, the level of the water was correct. And so I decided to make a sculpture acknowledging that, um, that simple um, set of coordinates. And it's hard to see, I know, but the drawing here for this one is right across from it. So there is the dark blue kind of um, stick. Um, you can see these lines, perhaps the orientation that gave me, in fact, the proportion and the angles of that in this instance. The title of this um, is Dutch for sailing vessel or sailor. So this version, um, the drawing for that, it shares the same sheet, is here. And I think of this as a sailor's knot that's attached to the side. And then this work, um, titled after the street that I was born on, um, and it comes from this photograph, which I found uh, about four years ago. Um, it, it seemed most remarkable to me, the, the reflections in this garage window. And I really didn't want to change anything about it. And um, so it's a picture of my parents soon after they were married. And then um, again, I, I took that very small photograph, enlarged it, and tried to imagine what the size of that window was, and then decided to, rather than make a graphic work, which seemed um, of no importance, rather to make something a bit more challenging, translating it into a relief. And it was important, obviously, that it be reflective. So this is cast bronze with nickel plating. Um, so next I'll show you um, works that are more based in pattern. Um, this was my studio in Rome, and at a certain point I decided to make a wall painting. Um, and really, as much as anything, it was in response to this permanent green hedge outside um, one of my doors on this patio. So the correspondence, I suppose, between the green, the red, the flicker, um, was uh, somewhat of a dictate in making this. This was another work done that year um, at another academy in an exhibition of site-specific works. This was the Romanian Academy, which um, is a Stalinist period sort of grandiose structure, um, too big for what they needed. And, um, but it was a very inviting situation. And these are um, made up of wood slats, um, then, then attached on the backside. 
um, this is a, um, a permanent um, public commission um, just south of Chicago, Governor State University in um, Manilow Sculpture Park. There are something like 25 or 30 um, cited works. And um, it's a glazed brick wall. The terracotta windows I made from the same clay and the same glaze from Texas um, so that the color would be the same. When you walk up to this, the middle window is exactly at eye level. And I thought of it um, most of all to frame the landscape in two directions. And I saw it as Victorian windows, portrait windows in a way. The path you see on the left is the, the path that um, commuters take from the metro train to campus. So as they walk by the white portion of the wall, um, the landscape sort of um, is kinetic. Now as I was putting these slides together, um, it struck me that um, if I can put forth an analogy here, um, I see that um, brick wall, this as um, two sides of a page, the page of a book, where both sides of the plane are equal yet different compositionally. Um, I was reminded of a conversation between Diana Freed and myself, recorded and transcribed, which is included in the catalog for the upcoming DePaul show that was mentioned. Matthew Gerson, the curator, um, has written the primary essay. But in the conversation, uh, Diana spoke eloquently about text, textiles, the nature of the book, the act of turning the page, its two sides, remembering what precedes our reading or looking. Um, so in some of her works in book form, through transparency, strong color, or perforation, uh, for one, from one page to the next, there is the visible presence as well as the recall, what happens when we go through a book, so that with a printed book, one can readily return to the earlier page. This analog experience, controlled visually and with touch, at our own speed and with built-in reflection, is, I think, an apt metaphor for my work over these years. And so here's another example where it's, you know, it's, um, perpendicular to the wall and offers these two opposing views. And, and in reality, you can't really appreciate either side um, together. You have to see them separately. So I'm going to end with a group of um, wall pieces and floor pieces and then a few shelf pieces, like I began in those sort of categories. This, um, this work actually came from a tantric painting that was quite fascinating to me. It was blue, th three blue uh, circles arranged horizontally, and one of the blues was ever so slightly darker. It was a test, really an eye test, and I suppose a form of um, meditation or concentration for you to look at it and determine you know, what was going on, which color was really the darkest. Um, but in this case, again, translated into sculptural terms, I made them convex and concave. So the side view is pretty clear. There are three different sizes, and um, when you look at this straight on, um, because it's dark blue and reflective, it was not easy at the very beginning to know if you were looking at a convex or a concave form. Um, here are two partner works that if you um, look at the edge of the, um, the work on the left, those grooves match exactly the, the cylindrical size and um, diameter of these tubular forms that are free but pinned to the wall. And these next few are very recent. There's the same um, kind of L-shaped frame or kind of truncated U-shaped frame with a slight variation um, that was used for both of those. 
more and more I've tended to use reflective surfaces, whether it's a glossy paint or um, nickel plating or aluminum. And um, I think the, the kind of liquid, um, almost transparent quality it offers, it also in some cases reflects the environment or the person standing in front, the color changes. Um, that's another, I guess, form of complexity that's that's been um, of interest to me. On very few occasions I've used um, cast polyurethane. This is one example where transparency with color seemed important. Here Cascades uh, makes reference to mountain ranges, um, one stacking against another. I've made a number of these, what I think of as shell for cantilevered pieces that um, are really in two parts. This is a melding of the two, but a lower section that holds horizontal against a wall for clear viewing, something that's more elaborate typically, and I think of as the sculptural component. And here obviously it's uh, held in suspension. And this is one of the more recent works, um, which is placed above one's head. If you looked at it straight on, these two kind of lime green forms would um, overlap and um, converge. And that's it. So thank you. And I'm happy to take some questions if there are some. Yes. It seems that your shapes and forms come first, but I can't tell. But I was wondering what point you cross a specific material, finish, and color to finalize the color. Well, the drawing really um, determines a lot. And um, sometimes I make models, rather casual um, models, one to one. And there I can modify or take apart and um, study better what the three-dimensional impact is. Um, I try to keep it open with the drawing, not certainly knowing a material color, even if it's on the floor, wall, hanging, corner. Um, it's really, my attempt is to try to keep that fairly pure. And then, at, you know, not too much later, once I decide to make the sculpture, then I have to make those material decisions. The color is something that usually comes at the very end, and when I do start painting a surface, it typically goes through um, some variations before it, it sits to the color I want. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> Right, and you know, that to me has all to do with the viewer. Um, as I talked about easel painting on the wall, obviously we don't stand across the room thinking we can really see it. And my sculptures are typically not very big, so people automatically come up to them. If a hanging piece is too high, then, then something's lost. Um, and at eye level, generally, that's, that's where I hang wall pieces. Um, but sometimes not. Some of, the, some of the works I've shown are really meant to be at stomach level. For you to begin to sense, um, it's not necessarily only about looking, but, but also the position of the body. And if there's something more rich happening on the top surface, then you have a viewpoint down. And um, so that's pretty calculated for me when I 
certainly when I finished it, and, and generally long before that. Yes? Well, yes, I mean, I, I've sp spoke to that a little bit, but, um, I, you know, now I, I do drawings that are pretty much the size of the sculpture. There's sheets stitched together or larger sheets if I can find decent paper that is that, but, um, but it allows me the flexibility to, in the drawing stage, project um, the size of the sculpture. And then I guess I interpret in some ways in my own way, um, what it is I want it to give the viewer. And that then um, feeds into the material, sense of weight, and the process. Things that are cast, you know, come out, you know, there, like a child, I suppose. It's there. There's no um, construction. It's, um, there could be seams, but it's, it's you know, it's volumetric. Um, so there's that part now. It can be um, a plaster and maybe it's s seemingly buoyant and it might look silly on the floor. If it's cast iron, it looks silly hanging from the ceiling. So those kinds of um, psychological or just practical things come into play. Um, if it's a very spindly complex thing that's constructed with joints that I know, and it's not gonna be painted, the joints become very prominent. Um, then I'm very careful about the wood and the, the, um, the placement uh, of where those things um, come to meet. And, um, you know, if it has a very crisp edge, it has to be a hard wood. Um, so all those kind of practical considerations come into play when I choose a material. Yeah, Annie? How do I feel about it? Well, certain materials can, can, can survive that, cast iron. Um, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, bronze over time eventually gets, um, you know, it gets its, um, its life and um, anything one person will do is, you know, irrelevant. So, um, and wood, you know, I, I try to put some kind of coating on these things, knowing that, um, you know, if it's on exhibition, sometimes people touch it and a fingerprint can transfer. Um, so I try to remedy um, what I can in advance, but, um, I, you know, I, I found people actually don't touch it much, um, at least by my observation. Um, yes? Yeah, in, in fact, I probably only, more than half the time now I'll embark on making it as I understand the drawing is telling me to do, and it undergoes a change. Um, even after it's finished, I, I then, I know it's missing something, and then the puzzle is what is that, and um, yeah, I, I sometimes then, you know, take part away or think, you know, additively, but, um, um, but that, that happens more and more. I think, you know, 15 years ago it, it never happened because the, the forms were so simple and either it was a good sculpture or it wasn't. But there was no way to, um, to address a change. And now I think because they're more complex, um, I can add another element and it's not outside the character, I suppose, of that complexity. Yes? Well, I guess maybe one thing I didn't stress enough was that the drawing, um, well, I guess I approach a, a drawing in two ways. If, I, if, if I'm really keen on making an homage or addressing a subject, I'm pretty faithful to um, staying within that source. And that sculpture gets a title. 
But in general, um, most of the time I start just sort of fishing for a form that that has meaning, I guess, that adds up to other things that, that um, resolves itself. So there's a lot of give and take in the drawing phase. And those are abstract and those are untitled. And on occasion they end up being strongly reminiscent of something and then I may give it a title, but it's a kind of half, half effort. Um, it's not something where I can tell you what the source is, but it is. Um, I mean, like the last one I showed was, was titled Icarus. Um, you know, it, it, it looks like um, a winged figure missing a part, and um, it's after a poem by William Carlos Williams and a painting by Peter Bruegel in Vienna, which, you know, has been um, circulating for me for 30 years. So that's never left, and I didn't make it a sculpture about that poem or that painting, but I figured, you know, it, it sort of circulates there, and so why not? So that's maybe a kind of in-between example. Yes. <laughs> There's a great room of Bruegel paintings at the um, Kunstdistorsches in Vienna. And there is, I mean, it's one of the great paintings, I think, in art history where Bruegel painted this farm scene and probably no more than the size of a large postage stamp is Icarus dipping into the water. And that's the painting, you know. And William Carlos Williams wrote a great book of poems about all of those paintings in that room. Someone else? Well, I, I, you know, I, I realize the benefit, and I, I, I sometimes think I should, but um, time is short, and um, I, well, t to be honest, I mean, I think there is a neutrality to the, um, to the surface when things are 3D printed, um, and, you know, but beyond that, um, it's, I guess it's the ability to spend time um, knowing what I've knowing what I've made, and along that process, um, being able to steer it ever so slightly so that it it's defined in the way that, um, however slow my mind works, it it ends up kind of matching up, and it's you know it's pleasant work. I don't I don't see it as laborious to to carve a, a chunk of wood into something that I want to see and go through that process. So um, for me, it's, you know, it, it, at this stage in my life especially, I don't, I don't want to learn that, that stuff. <laughs> yes. Well, there are many, many, and I think um, five. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Alex, you know there's so many. I I hate to start down that list. Um, you know what I showed you these images at Portland Center for the Visual Arts. That was an incredibly rich experience. Um, you know, and um, I mean, virtually every artist who showed at Leo Castelli, Paula Cooper, you know, were shown there of work done in the past couple of years of their making. And it was a huge 10,000 square foot space. So, you know, there was maybe, um, I mean, Alice Neal basically had a retrospective. And Mangold, Robert Mangold had maybe um, 14 or 16 large paintings. and. Um, 
probably about 20 wall drawings by Saul, Le Saul LeWitt. Um, with the artist? Where, where? Oh, in Portland, Oregon, when I was a young art student. So, um, you know, that, that's a deep foundation for me. And I've, I've um, you know, for those living artists, I've, I've remained essentially interested in, in, you know, from that period, 1960 on up, and um, yeah, then there are many, many younger contemporary artists I'm, I'm very interested in. Well, you know, I don't think there is. Um, I love the Monadnock building, John Root's building. Um, that's maybe my favorite Chicago building. Um, but I haven't taken into account, I guess, a given building in Chicago and decided to make a sculpture in response. Um, it's funny. I mean, I guess it's always this sort of distance, um, things in Europe or um, Japan. Um, you know, I travel, I take a few po photographs, come back and um, think about it. And maybe that's an important ingredient is this kind of reflection or distance or remove that allows me to personalize it or go through that transition towards um, not aping the building or mimicking it or being too literal, but um, ingesting it and then answering it in a, in a way that seems appropriate. Okay, thank you.